Now we'll talk with Rachel Carson, who is Carlson, not Rachel Carson. Rachel Carlson, who is the CEO and co-founder of Guild Education. Rachel, thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, I guess, where you are. Thanks. I'm getting my video unhooked right now. There we go. There you are. Hey, hey, hello. Um, you know, the coronavirus outbreak has thrown all of education off track, but it seems to have particularly threatened the future of higher education uh, institutions. We're going to talk about what Guild is doing specifically, but can, let me ask you to start a couple of broader questions about the state of higher education. Uh, first, as you've seen, there's been a lot of debate this spring about whether online learning is a fair substitute for in-person classes. You've seen some students and parents talking about uh, refunds or um, uh, uh, from their from their institution. What what have we learned about the quality of online learning? Not only in the institutions that have focused on it before, but in others who try to dive into it uh, in a rather rapid fashion this spring. Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. And I think you have to, in some ways, unpack what are you talking about when you talk about college versus learning? So can you have the college experience that the 18 to 22 year old is hoping for in terms of the residential learning experience, the dorms, the football games, heck, the frat parties, right? Um, that's incredibly complex in this time. And I, I think it's a fair conversation we're having. But it's a worth a note to remind everyone that only 27% of college students today will ever step foot in a dorm. The other 73% of students were already learning either on commuter campuses where they left their job, they jumped on a public transportation environment or a car that they, you know, hoped and shared with their family members. They jetted over to community college, they went to an hour and a half of classes, and then they headed back to their second job. For those students, they're sitting in the back of a lecture hall and this new learning environment where they can be learning in a zoom environment with more proximity to a professor where they can take classes after they put their kids to bed because we know 55 percent of learners today are parents that's actually a, a better form of learning so it, it kind of depends what you're comparing it to so for many of us who had the pleasure of, of that residential campus experience there is a real sense of loss we need to figure out what that will look like this fall but talk, talking about college and learning as the same thing is, is complicated for the people who candidly need higher education most right now which are the 30 million americans who just lost their jobs a, a good good distinction a couple they'll take that apart first what is your feeling about this fall? Should there, I mean, should that, for that qu roughly quarter of the student body that had that traditional experience, is that coming back in September? Oh, should it be? Yeah, it's the million dollar question. Um, I, I think it's gonna be complicated and we're seeing lots of schools make different decisions. I think we're also gonna see some mergers of campuses who no longer can sustain a smaller student footprint with the same size administration. And so everyone for 10 years has been saying, when will the great college merger uh, happen? And I think this might be the catalyst for that, but preserving the campus experience for that quarter of the demographic who want it is hopefully something that we can bounce back from at the right time once the health and safety security issues are taken care of. Explain us, I want you to explain your model, what Guild has done, uh, and whether uh, this crisis and the mass unemployment that has resulted from it give you any concern about whether focusing on employers as the means of funding some of this expanded post-secondary education is the right way to go. Sure. So at Guild, we uh, help the 88 million Americans, which is more than half of the workforce and now way more than half the workforce with the 30 million who just lost their jobs, um, figure out how to advance their education and career while on the job in partnership with their companies. Um, you highlighted that the companies are helpful funders, and that's true, but that's not the only role they play. And in fact, we'd be delighted if the government played a larger role in helping workers pay for their education. That just hasn't been the case. Where we think the employer sector can be quite helpful, regardless of funding though, is in playing an important guiding and signaling power about helping workers understand what the future of work looks like, whether that's within their company or beyond their company. And so to give examples, you know, we have programs with companies like Chipotle and Walmart who help their frontline workforce understand what moving into middle-class jobs in those companies look like, whether that's running a restaurant or moving into the supply chain or the technology team at an e-commerce organization within Walmart. There's also organizations like Lowe's who've helped their cashiers actually leave the business, but become skilled tradespeople. So go back to school to become electricians and carpenters and plumbers. 
and they won't work for Lowe's eventually, but the ROI in business case is there for Lowe's because the communities so desperately need more plumbers and electricians to install the kinds of things you buy at a Lowe's. And so I think the employers can play a crucial role regardless of the funding. We are still seeing huge appetite from companies to fund, but most importantly, they better understand what the jobs of the future look like. And that's what workers are dying to figure out in this time of deep economic uncertainty. If we're looking at elevated unemployment potentially for a while, I mean, the CBO has the number staying high through uh, 2021, what is the best way to help many of those out of work use that time most productively to enhance their skills and put them on a better track going forward? Are there ways specifically to reach those who have been thrown out of work by this, by this crisis? Yeah, so we've been doing a tremendous amount of work with nonprofit organizations, other tech companies, and then uh, hiring partners, the employers that are capable of hiring, as well as those who are having to run layoffs and furloughs right now to think about what would be the ethical uh, outplacement or ethical upskilling initiative mm. for this crisis. Because prior to COVID, we knew that there were 88 million Americans who needed to reskill or upskill before they retired. And America didn't really have a plan for that. So companies were putting it together in different schools and it was kind of a decentralized plan. This crisis might be the opportunity to finally say, what are we gonna do for these workers? And we can start with the 30 million who tragically just lost their jobs. And so we'll, we're announcing uh, things in the coming weeks with these organizations that think about how do you help uh, workers have short-term certificates and programs that help get them back to work as quick as possible, but in middle skilled and high demand jobs, rather than putting them back into whatever role they were in that might Ooh. not be a job of the future or might already have been on the extinction path due to automation or technology that's coming down the pike in the next three to five years. So doing a lot of work on that, but to answer your question succinctly, it's short-term certificates and programs that stack into other programs. So we're not mm -hmm. telling anyone that the college degree is a door that is shut to them, but we're starting with what are those short-term credentials and certificates that will launch you into a job of the future? And then you can stack that learning as you continue as a lifelong learner. And, and I would note that even before this, obviously, in some of the community colleges that were having enormous trouble, problems with completion, were trying to move toward that short-term certificate model so that people have something for their time rather than just kind of a year and, and, you know, and, and, and never finishing the degree. Let me ask many versions of, of the same question we talked about kind of uh, at the outset. Jonathan from Edmonton, Canada. Some students are clearly having a better quality emergency remote delivery experience than others. Uh, is there a backlash that is inevitable in the medium or long run against online learning, given the, the, the variation in quality that people are experiencing? You know, on one dimension, probably. I think that's going to be most intense in the younger years, the kindergarten through third grade, mm. and God bless the teachers who are trying to figure out how to do uh, the kind of social, emotional, and behavioral curriculum that is a kindergarten classroom online. And my right. sister-in-law is a pre-K teacher, and boy, are the stories harrowing of what she's trying to figure out right now. I think as it relates to working adult learners, um, I think online learning has significant upsides as we've talked about. You know, yeah. when I talk to our students, this is a much more intimate and dynamic environment for them to learn than a large lecture hall that required them to figure out how to get to the campus and how to get a babysitter while they went to school. So yeah. I think it really depends what population you're talking about. And I think we're gonna keep improving, right? This has been a, a surprise opportunity for all of us to learn online, but the schools that have been doing this for a decade are seeing tremendous student satisfaction as they always have. And those are schools like Southern New Hampshire University, Purdue Global, Brandman, right. et cetera. Right. I, I, I mean, it may be the challenge is more places that have not emphasized this trying to leap into it more quickly, right? I mean, that's particularly those that may have very high tuition points, uh, you know, and suddenly you're not in a, you're not in a lecture hall at elite global university, you're in front of your laptop, you know, in your, in your parents, you know, in your whole bedroom from high school. Um, now, uh, this question may also uh, uh, lead to answers that are differential for the younger versus older students. But, but one of our uh, uh, viewers asked, with lots of schools moving away from letter grades and toward pass-fail systems, how do we ensure students are meeting standards or, evil, or even able to demonstrate exceptional work? Is that a relevant question for the, for the adult learners as well, or is that primarily something that's uh, more, more focused for the younger? 
Yeah, I think that's relevant for, it's actually back to your point, it's relevant to the schools that weren't prepared for an online learning environment. So the best online learning in the country is actually highly personalized, way more than a lecture hall ever could be. I, I went to Stanford, I sat in a lecture mm -hmm. hall, and the, the professor was, you know, probably a Nobel Prize winner, but didn't know what I was learning or absorbing. An online competency-based model can dynamically adjust the next question you get or the next problem you tackle based on how you did on the last problem. Mm -hmm. And we have plenty of schools who are doing that type of learning today. Now, was anyone able to spin that up in the last eight weeks with COVID if they weren't previously doing it? No. And so there's going to be some winners and some losers here in terms of which schools were preparing for a personalized online learning environment, in which case you can keep having competency-based and rigorous assessment models versus needing to default to pass-fail. Um, how about, you, you know, you've talked, you talk about how much debt that you have really preempted, save people from uh, accumulating, how big a barrier is cost to adults adding upskilling during their career? It's massive. And I think one of the things that happens too often in, I'll call it the chattering class, whether that's Washington or the um, elite environments that many folks talk about higher ed in, is people say, oh, it's only $2,000 or it's only $4,000 mm -hmm. to go to that community college. Well, up until this point, the average American had $400 in their checking and savings account. And that was pre-COVID. And we know that that's now depleted pretty substantially. So telling someone to take their emergency savings account, which was for a health crisis or for when the car broke down, and telling them to spend only $2,000 to go back to school, it is incredibly problematic. And so we've seen that when employers take that funding requirement off the table is when you see just tremendous mm. engagement from low and middle income workers heading back to school to upskill. Let me ask you a very practical question from Mishi, I think pronouncing that right, in Boston. What do you predict will be the most highly in-demand skills post-COVID, and where can workers who have been laid off or in furlough find the most effective skill upskilling programs for those skills right now? You know, we, we have seen in many respects that the jobs that are the most essential to keeping the economy running are those that the economy is treated as the most disposable. Uh, you know, and in, in, before all of this started, what, but what do you think people are going to be looking for coming out and where can people go to, to help prepare themselves for that? Yeah. So I think, you know, there's the, the jobs that everyone talks about, right? Plumbing, electrical, nursing, healthcare aren't going anywhere, but there's also people management, complex problem solving, process management, uh, supply chain, right? Supply chain is part of this whole challenge and the whole opportunity that's gonna get us out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. And so we um, spend a lot of time working with students to help them understand how the competencies that they might've gained from say a retail job, a hospitality role, you name it, actually translate into those jobs of the future. Um, the data is available and we hope that every school in the country is really taking a pause to think about that. Because the last thing we should do is guide students into low quality, low demand degrees at this time of deep financial and economic insecurity. Let me, let me ask you real quickly a policy question. After some considerably more expensive proposals were discussed during the Democratic Bar Party primary, Joe Biden is going to be running in the general election on a plan to for free public four-year uh, college tuition for families at 125k or below and the cancellation of student debt for families in that same income bracket who attended uh, public colleges or universities or community college. Um, what do you think of those ideas? How big a dent could they make in, uh, in, 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 in broadening the circle of people who feel that they can afford to upskill or, and could there be unanticipated uh, consequences? So I agree with many of those proposals, but I hope we don't make some of the mistakes that happened in 08, 09. And I had the pleasure of being on the Obama campaign and a firm advocate for most of the work we did there. But it is dangerous when you only endorse one corner of a sector. And so mm. only endorsing the public nonprofits and not the private nonprofits, many of whom are great providers of not only liberal arts curriculums, but also non-traditional programs, as well as great upskilling opportunities. I mean, think about all the private schools that we're reading about in the paper right now that are at risk of going out of business. Yeah. I think we need to think with a marketplace lens on and really focus on the quality of the institution and not whether it's funded by a state and a state school versus a private nonprofit. And so that's probably the thing I have the most concern about. I think more broadly, a lot of good could be done from that opportunity in that situation. I just hope the policymakers and the Democratic Party pause for a second and think about market manipulation before they only endorse one corner of the higher ed market versus mm -hmm. thinking about the private nonprofit schools as well. Well, Rachel, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much for taking some time this morning. Thanks, Ron. This is great. Bye-bye. Right.